So this is lecture 23 of 5312. And what we're going to do is we're going to build upon the ISI rant that I had in the last lecture in lecture 22. So what we saw in the last lecture, and I chose this variable for a specific reason. So in the last lecture, we called this thing why not. This, <laughs> why not? <laughs> Jeez, it's going to be a long night. So um, why not is the sampling instant of the desired sample that contains it and all the ISI components, precursor and postcursor, plus noise. Boo. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to call why not z. Why not z? Well, z is going to be, uh, it's, it's kind of intentional because what we're going to do is we're going to model this so we have deterministic samples, right? Well, sort of. So all these i guys, they're kind of random because it's either plus or minus one. We don't know which one. It's Bernoulli, right? But the real randomness is in N. So the pulse shape, the resulting channel impulse response, combined with the transmit filter, even though we don't know what it is, if you do channel sounding, you'll know exactly what it is the moment that you sound the channel. So the channel impulse response is deterministic. The information, once you, let's say you look into your crystal ball and say, I know what the future eyes are, and I know what the past eyes are, and I know what the eye is right now. That's deterministic. The only thing we don't know is the noise. Ah, okay. So, first thing we do is let's say we let I not equal one. Uno! Now, that Z expression looks like the following, okay? So we have um, the precursor, first precursor term, the first post-cursor term, noise, and we forgot other ISI terms for now. The reason is, is that, did you notice how the things decay? Let's take the most significant precursor and post-cursor elements. So that's the one immediate to the desired sampling instant, right? Now, what we have is, this is going to be cool because this is graphical. Because what happens is, I'm going to show you guys that the probability of error, because this is antipodal, right? You're plus one or minus one. But we add the ISI distortion. That's D, right? And so what happens is this is some like this is some sort of D min, and this is our variance, right? We don't we don't put the n naught, otherwise we'll have square roots and stuff. So this is the step before. Remember we had like the square root of d min squared divided by 2 n naught or whatever. So this is kind of like, take it a few steps back. This is essentially by, so this, you know, if we wanted to be right, so, you know, this is a sort of amplitude, so square root of all of this squared divided by this squared, right? And so we just got rid of the squares and square roots. But the, the question is, What's our error performance? What does this thing mean? This E I minus 1 I 1. What does this, these two guys mean? We're averaging across all possible combinations of ISI. The only way to find out is let's look at the next slide. Like, seriously, what are the possible combinations? In fact, even before we do that, let's, you know where this is going. Me, 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 me. So, this is where we're heading. So what happens is, we take, let's say we, we have that, that really cool pulse, right? So we have, and so what happens is, suppose that's zero. That's desired. And suppose at time instant t and time instant minus t, we also have this and that. So this is my h, oh, that's my h0 term. This point over here is my h1. That's my post cursor term of my, of my, of my response, the combined 
channel impulse response and the transmit filter, and that's H minus 1, right? So let's say we forget about all the other terms because they're lesser, they're smaller, they don't contribute to the ISI as much as these guys do. So let's take this one step further. So how, what's, what are sort of the combinations that we can have? So we can either have a plus or minus 1 multiplied by this, and we can have a plus or minus 1 here. So we have the scenario, let's say this is 1, where we have H1, okay, and we have H1. So they're both plus 1. Uh, sorry, both minus 1. No, 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 both plus 1. Then we have minus H1, and we have H1, or minus, uh, minus H minus 1, sorry. And then we have minus H minus 1, minus H1, and then, of course, the last case. Uh, I'm thinking... and then minus H1. Thank you. So what happens is my distortion term, so D in this case, will be that plus that. Here it's going to be minus H minus 1 plus H1. That's going to be minus H minus 1 minus H1. And this is going to be H minus 1 minus H1. Right? So what happens is essentially, and, and these h values, obviously in this case, are negative, both of them. Right? So if we have a positive value uh, for h1, uh, sorry, h0, and h0 is obviously positive, right? And what's the worst case scenario of all of this? It would be this guy, right? Because this guy is a negative value, this guy is a negative value, you sum it together, and this is what's going to be eating into your desired symbol. So you have H0 plus D. That, this guy here, so let me highlight it, is going to produce the most negative value of them all. And which one would be the best case? Why is that? So let's say this point here, this point here is like, you know, minus a, and that's minus a, because people might get, be getting confused. How could plus h minus 1 plus h1 be the worst case? Let's say h minus 1 is equal to minus a, and h1 is equal to minus a. So you get the most possible value that's counting against h0, which is the most positive, right? And then on the other hand, the guy that I have here is like double negatives. So it's like minus, minus A, minus, minus A. So it's 2A, right? And then everything else is kind of interesting. So, so, um, so what happens is, in this, so let's say if we have these actual values, what do we have? So in this case, you have minus 2A. What's this guy? Zero. So the ISI really can't, in this fluky case, cancels out. This is actually 2A. And here's 0 again. So now if we go to our probability of error, right, let's look at just the specific, uh, one of these specific cases. So we have H0 plus D over sigma. Sigma, the noise variance, or the square root of the noise variance, is noise standard deviation is constant. So which one will perform the best out of the four possible Ds? It will be 2A. Why? Because the Q function... The larger the input value, the much smaller the output value, right? So if you plot this, what happens is, let's say you, you, you um, um, have 1 over sigma. You keep that constant, right? What happens is your probability of error, when you have such a huge numerator, will be down here. Uh, actually, no, I take that back. This should be H naught plus D 
over sigma, right? One of these terms. So let's say it's sigma. And then what happens is, on the other hand, if the worst case, the minus a eats into the h naught, which is a positive value, makes the numerator the smallest possible value. So what happens when we have a small input to a q function? We get really poor probability of error. We get a small output. So we get something that's here. And then these two guys, it's just coincidental they're equal to each other, are kind of straddled in between. So what happens is, this is the problem with ISI. What ISI does is it nudges, it cr like it could either, it, it can either constructively or destructively combine with your desired sample. So if I have something that enables my symbol to move further away from the decision threshold, I'm making it more immune to the noise. And when, on the other hand, I have ISI that's eating away at that margin between the decision threshold and my resulting desired sample, I just need a little less noise and I can get the same messed up scenario, right? So that's, so as a result, on the doc cam, that's why, let's say, what you've got here is this kind of like the spectrum, right, of possible d values. So this is, again, the exact same thing I just wrote. You have these four possible scenarios, and the worst case, in this case, is, is this, because I'm guessing all the h values are positive, right? So here is like, you have the negative of these positive values eating into your desired sample. And so what ends up happening is your Q function will produce the smallest possible value. It ends up at top here, and then progressively gets to the best case, which is this guy, which adds the most margin to your noise. Okay? And then what happens is you average, you average, if you, if you assume all of these points are equally likely to occur, you average them across all of them equally, and that will give you the average error performance of your system given ISI when you, you look at the first pre and post cursors. Okay? So, um, one thing that we're going to do is, given this formulation, what we're going to do is the following. We're going to set up some bounds. Bounds. That's almost like training a dog. So I'm not sure how many people here own dogs or got dogs from the get-go or adopted dogs and such. But you always have to establish bounds, like what they can do and what they can't do. You have to show who's boss, right? So, um, but in a nice way. <laughs> like the, the thing is, you can be mad at the dog, but hit the dog. No. So what happens is you can do something like a turn-off bound. So there's Chernoff, there's Chebyshev. So this is totally from probability and random processes. So remember that Z argument? So Z is equal to H naught plus D. What happens is, suppose we set it up. So we know that Z, so let's, let's look at the analysis. So, Remember what I was saying before. So su suppose that I naught, the desired transmitted symbol, is 1, right? And we saw, if this is antipodal, that we either have plus 1s or we have minus 1s. So where's the decision threshold in all of this? It is here, right? The threshold is zero. So if the amplitude, if let's say I transmit a one, but the noise and the ISI re yields an ampli a resulting amplitude that's less than zero, it will de get decoded as minus one, and that's an error, right? So probability-wise, how do we represent this? So remember, what is our expression for the probability? Z, because we're assuming this scenario without loss in generality. We can do this for minus 1 as well. Is H0 plus D plus the noise. Right? So we know that the noise is 0 mean Gaussian. Okay? So what happens is, what is the probability of error? 
is when the probability that z produces a value, output value, that is less than 0. Because even, theoretically, it should also be equal to, because then it's a coin, coin, coin toss, because we're on the decision threshold. But let's, let's forget about that for now, OK? So what happens is the probability of error is when we have this variable, this resulting sort of desired sample plus ISI plus noise produces a value that's less than 0. What's random? Not the ISI. We're not assuming, we're assuming the symbols are well known. The noise is random, right? It's Gaussian. So it's a Gaussian noise added to a deterministic set of values. So what happens is our z is a random variable, too. So in fact, it'll be a Gaussian random variable, but with a non-zero mean, right? Or is it? That's what we're going to have to find out. So what happens is, right now, does everyone see what, uh, like, this is a problem, like, what we want is, if, like, you know, what is the probability that there's so much bad noise, there's so much noise that it eats away at that margin such that we produce a value, z, that's less than zero. The probability of that happening is our probability of error. That will result in an error scenario. All right? So what do we do? What we do is essentially we work our way down into this. We expand it. What is z equal to? h naught plus isolate for h naught. And so what we're left with is this error event, right? This is, this is just like manipulating. If we go back to what I wrote on if we replace this, what do we have? h naught plus d plus n is less than 0. Let's move this guy over, right? So we can do that. And so when we have this scenario, ooh, I think I forgot something. Because it's negative, yeah. Yeah. So if it's negative, um, yeah, then 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 th that changes. So um, but what happens is this is our error event. What we want to do is you probably turn off bound, right? So because exponents are monotonically increasing functions, right? So if we have this inequality, nothing stops us from bringing this to the, uh, making this e to the d plus n and e to the h naught. And in fact, it also doesn't stop us from putting this pesky dummy variable s into all of it as well. So this is totally legit. Because what happens is, like the max and min functions, the probability function is a relative thing, right? As long as we can map it back to the actual expression. But there's a method behind my madness here, which I'll show in a few minutes. What happens is the first thing we want to do is we bring this error event scenario, we make an exponent out of it, OK? And now what we want to do is we turn to our friend Chebyshev. And we know that Chebyshev, so what we're doing is we're going to take this guy. We're going to take him, because I don't know how to calculate the probability of this. This is going to be something messy, right? When, because the problem is this guy's deterministic. This, not quite, because we have plus, plus ones and minus ones and h ones and h minus ones. It's a mess, right? So there is some randomness there. This is totally random. So what I'm going to do is I use Chebyshev's inequality, I'm going to make this an expectation. So what I do is I know Chebyshev says this. So we look at this guy. Let x equal this guy here. And let t equal this guy here. Totally cool, right? Plug that in to Chebyshev. And so now I have e. Uh-oh. So the people looking at home, ha, 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 they should be here. No, just kidding. So what happens is I take Chebyshev's expression. And then I say, let x equal to this exponent here. Let t equal to this exponent there. 
plug it into the right hand side, and what we get is this expression, which we can break up. And it turns out that the ISI and the noise are actually independent of each other. Because noise doesn't care. It's not influenced at all by the ISI in the channel. The ISI, likewise, is a deterministic thing with this Bernoulli kind of information source that, again, is independent of the, no of the noise, right? So this now breaks up into the, and this guy here at the bottom, the expectation couldn't care less because H0 is deterministic anyway. So we get this nice setup. And what is this guy? It's a characteristic function. So this guy is the characteristic function of the moment generating function of the random variable d. And this guy is the characteristic function of the moment generating function of the random variable n, the noise. So now what we've got is characteristic functions. You say, OK, so what? Well, let's take this one step further. We express these as characteristic functions. And so let's say for now, we assume that d is 0. Let's, let's say there is no ISI for now. And say that, uh, so what happens is, what is our characteristic function then? Uno, right? Makes sense. One. What we're left with is this guy. Sorry, bad habit. <laughs> we have this guy here. And now what we want to do is find how do we minimize that probability of error, right? So what we end up doing is we take the first and second order derivatives with respect to s, this weird dummy variable s. And what we find is that s is equal to h naught over sigma squared. And then we just need to make sure that it is a minima, not a saddle point, not a maxima. And when we do that, it turns out that our probability of error bound is this super weak exponent. And this is also assuming that we have 0 ISI, right? We made the assumption d is equal to 0, which means our character. Yeah. Why is this weak? Because we're forgetting about the ISI. This thing is sort of like. Let's forget that the ISI could be a determining factor in affecting our probability of error. So this is still somewhat optimistic, right? It's not that tight. So now let's consider one ISI term, right? So let's look at D. This guy here. This is one of our post-cursor ISIs. This is the first one. <laughs> so what we do is. Let's say we have, this is our desired, uh, is that our desired? Hmm, okay. So, oh, no, no, no. Okay, so we do, ah, okay, oh, darn. Okay, so we're, we're, okay, so now I'm, I'm lost. Ah. So what happens is we actually have, one is both a plus and a minus one. So we actually have a precursor, postcursor, ISI, same amount of, in terms of the channel response at those two points, that's why we have h1 and h1, but then one is a plus and one's a minus, right? This guy and that guy. So what we're doing is we're actually, sorry, it's not precursor, postcursor, it's postcursor, but we're averaging out whether we transmit a one or a minus one at that point, postcursor. So this is the average of that, th this guy, which in fact, what is this guy equal to? What is our characteristic function equal to? Cosh. Oh, I love the sound of that trig, identity, uh, tr trig function. It's not cos. It's not sine. It's not tan. Cosh. Right? <laughs> I don't know. It's just, you know. So what happens is when we write it in this way, an S we're assuming is not complex. What we have is this guy here. So what ends up happening is when we have all these distortion elements, let's say we go from minus n1 to plus n2. So all these pre and post cursor elements, it will be the product of Cauchy's. Okay? So what we do is we look at the single case, and we take the average 
of the plus and minus one for that ISI, and we find out it's a cosh of that. And then, oh, gee whiz, all the ISI contributions is a product of all those coches, right? Now, when we see this, okay, and we put this into the expression, the probability of error bound is going to be what we have before, this weak thing, multiplied by one of the coches, if we're looking at the first term, post cursor. And so now the thing is, we, we don't know what this S, because this expression here, we found exactly what the S expression is. How do we solve it for this more generic case, right? So this is the predecessor before we did the min and max. So what we had before was this expression here. We found out what this guy is. This is Cauch, right? This guy here, this is the characteristic function of that ESN, and we saw what that's equal to, right? And what happens is, that's this guy here, but we don't know what S is. We don't know what S is. We don't know what S is. Trial and error, we find out what the S is, okay? So what we do is, we, we by trial and error, um, we, you just plug in values of S to see what is the minimum. And that will give you the best bound. Yes, Paolo? Find the S in um, Trial and so to find the best S value by trial and error, like plug it in, is this small enough? Plug it in, is this small enough? Plug it in, is this small enough? And so, you know, you can try a starting point. So you can try, you can't really see it here, but let's say H naught minus D naught, like let's say one case, and then you just zero in from there, okay? Because that's the most significant term. Okay, so that wraps up sort of like the first part, which is understanding how the samples influence the probability of error expressions that we've been looking at so far, right? So as we saw, so noise pushes a desired sample below some sort of decision-making threshold, creating an error, right? And what the ISI does is it helps it along. It dec decreases the margin of error, if you will. Now what we're going to look at is how do we design So what we looked far, we looked at when we have a channel, when we have a channel that is essentially um, whatever we're transmitting, and that's bad news, right? So what we want to do is, can we choose a channel transmit filter such that when it's combined with the channel, it yields something that has zero ISI? And the answer is yes. Right? So what happens is, let's look at our basic model. Source information, impulse modulation. In this case, we have H. It shouldn't say to channel. It should be from channel, because this is the combination of the transmit filter and the channel. And suppose we have a rectangular shape for H of F, right, in the frequency domain. That looks like a sync pulse in the time domain. Correct? OK. And, you know, we have a certain bandwidth, and we know that um, in the time domain, it looks like this, 2AW sync 2WT. And so the sync pulse will look like this if, let's say, W is equal to 1 over 2T. And what it turns out is that if we have our channel look like that in the frequency domain, and in the time domain, the impulse response of the transmit filter plus channel looks like this, like a sync pulse, right? And if the bandwidth is equal to, right, the single side bandwidth, so W is equal to 1 over 2T, or the double sided bandwidth is equal to 1 over T, and T is the symbol period, what do you have? You have a sync pulse where at t equals 0, the desired sample, we have something non-negative. I mean, sorry, non-zero. And at every t seconds, boom, 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 you got a zero crossing. Oh. Let's go back to the doodling board. Eh? Yay. So what does that mean? I'm going to do my best here, folks. So,
I think this is already overly ambitious. I'm trying to draw four of these. So let's say my first sync pulse looks like this. Okay. The next guy, let's say, so that's a plus one. Let's say the next guy is also a plus one. Look how they're intersecting at the zero crossings. And the only place at a sampling instant that's not zero is the desired sample, right? Let's say the next guy is minus one. And then let's say the next guy is plus one. Yeah, now it's getting ugly. So what happens is, if you notice, at the zero crossings, or at the sampling instances, what do we have? Desired sample and the ISI contributions are zero. Desired sample and the ISI contributions are zero. They should be zero. Bad drawing. Desired sample, the ISI contributions are zero. Desired sample, the ISI contributions are zero, and so on and so forth. This is a beautiful result. So this is what we call a Nyquist pulse. And because the reason for that is if we go and look at the doc cam version, what happens is at every sampling instant, only, the only thing that will not be zero will be the desired sample. And everything else will be zero. So it's almost like, for instance, um, the H1 and H minus 1, the H2, H minus 2, the H3, H minus 3, they're all zero at those instances. So I don't care what I1, I minus 1, I2, I minus 2, doesn't matter what they are. They're multiplied by zero, and don't that d term goes to zero. This is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful filter, but it's not realizable. Ah, there is a caveat. Why is that? Sync pulses have to stretch from minus infinity to infinity. If you truncate them, they don't have perfect. They don't have perfect zero crossings, and therefore will have ISI. I know, but. Don't lose hope, because there's another pulse shape that is equally as powerful, which many of you use unknowingly until this day. Okay, So this concludes lecture 23. Okay, So what we're going to do, because I'm on a roll, is we're going to just jump right into lecture 23.